Okay, hello um, and welcome everybody to today's webinar from Imperial College London. My name is Matthew Wilkes and I'm one of the International Student Recruitment Officers here at Imperial College. Um, today I'm going to be telling you a little bit more about how you can help fund your undergraduate studies uh, at Imperial College London. Um, so you might have noticed that there's a questions tab um, just at the bottom right um, of this webinar software. Um, we'll be answering some of your more general questions live at the end of the webinar. Um, and we'll also reply to every single question that you have. And we'll get to all of them um, after the presentation. So if you want to use that question software to ask any questions that you have that are specific to you or that are more general, um, and like I say, we will answer them at the end. Uh, do bear with us. Um, there's lots and lots of you listening in uh, listening in today uh, from all over the world so we we will get through to you um, just don't log out otherwise your question disappears and we can't answer it so today's webinar is going to look at um, various different ways that you can help to fund your undergraduate study at Imperial College so um, a few different ways to look at that you might have already heard of we'll be we'll be looking at undergraduate loans uh, we'll be looking at those all important scholarships and bursaries We'll be looking at part-time work opportunities um, and then there'll be a little bit of extra advice some areas where you can do some further research um, as well so just to remind you about why it is that you you might want to uh, pay to come and study at Imperial College London um, I'm sure you're all fam familiar with these statistics but Imperial College London is a world top 10 university by any measure that you, you that you would look at um, we're in we're in the world top 10 whether that's with employers whether that's a quality of our research quality of our teaching um, worldwide we're in the top 10 in the UK we tend to be in the uh, in the top five now, our community uh, at Imperial, we're, we're a specialist institution. We only teach at undergraduate level, science, engineering, um, and medicine. And we have some postgraduate business uh, courses in our postgraduate business school as well. Um, now, what that means is, um, that specialist institution, it means that there's lots of like-minded people, uh, lots of specialist facilities, um, lots of closely related subjects. So there's a lot of potential for uh, collaborative discovery um, across your subject boundaries. So that's really great for our students because they have lots of opportunities to work alongside and, and learn from people in different departments. Um, so that can be a really, really useful, useful thing moving forwards. We've got lots of world leading staff as well, as you can see there. Um, we've got 14 Nobel Prize winners through our history. Um, unfortunately, all of our Nobel Prize winners uh, are now dead. So we're always on the lookout for our next potential Nobel Prize winner. In terms of where we're situated, on the left-hand side of your screen, you can see that Imperial College London is just below Hyde Park, um, a really lovely area of green space in London. Um, we're situated next door to the Science Museum, just down the road from the Natural History Museum, um, just down the road from the Royal Albert Hall as well, which is where all of our students graduate from. So that's a fantastic opportunity to have a, a lovely day out in the, in the Royal Albert Hall and go on the stage there. Um, and lots and lots of parts, the more sort of tourist parts of London, um, are are just down just down the road. Now, obviously, being in London and being uh, such a fantastic university to to study at, you're going to be interested in in how much it costs. Now, this uh, table in front of you breaks down the cost of living um, over a fifty two over fifty two weeks. Um, so, what we say is roughly each student would need £1,200 per month to meet their living costs. The, the main uh, bit of that living cost is obviously accommodation, um, and then food, travel, some personal costs, maybe some books and things like that. Now, as an undergraduate student, this is obviously based on 52 weeks a year, that accommodation, food, budgets, and things like that. As an undergraduate student, you're not at university every single week of every single month you have very long holidays you've got holidays over the over the christmas period holidays over the easter period and a long summer holiday now in that time if you're in university halls you won't have to pay for necessarily a 52 week let um, they're usually more more towards a sort of 30 35 week 
um, lets. What that means is really that £1,200 a month is for each month that you are actually studying at university. Now, if you go home, whether or not that means uh, a flight, a train, short car journey, journey on the tube, um, and you, you return to be living, living at home, you obviously won't need to pay for accommodation during that time unless you choose to. And in terms of fees, which is the uh, the other major cost um, of any sort of university degree, uh, these obviously vary per course and are subject to um, inflation each year. If you're uh, from the UK or from the EU, you've got a fixed fee, um, which we'll come on to in the next slide. If you're not from the UK, or not from the EU in terms of where you live, um, usually, then our fees then vary per course. Um, and we, you can look at those individual fee prices um, online or you can ask us in the in that questions tab. Now that decision about your about your fees um, and about whether or not you count as being from from the UK, i.e. a home student or, or the EU or whether you count as an international student for your fee status. That's a decision that's taken by the university. Um, and it's based on responses to a questionnaire if it's not if it's not clear. Now, it's for ordinary residents of the EU. They are eligible for the same the same price as UK students um, pay. So it's not about your citizenship. It's not about the passport that you carry. It's about where you usually live, where your everyday life kind of uh, takes place. Now, that um, that's been been guaranteed for the students who are starting with us in September 2018. So regardless of what happens with Brexit, if you're um, if you're if you come down as somebody who's EU for your fee status, you're starting with us in September 20, 2018, then you'll be paying the, the home UK fee. Now that home fee at Imperial College is £9,250 per, uh, per year. Um, and that's only subject to maybe going up a little bit with inflation, but it's going to be around £9,250 per year. And we can talk about how, obviously in this webinar, how to fund that um, and ways to, uh, to, to deal with that fee. So something that you can use if you're, if you're a home student, I'll quickly draw attention to it, uh, is our student finance calculator. So what this looks at, is you can plug in some details about yourself, just a few tick boxes, um, hit calculate, and it will tell you how much funding you're eligible for um, from various different sources if you're, if you're a home student. If you just type in student finance calculator um, Imperial College, it should come up. If you just pop that into Google, it should come up. It's a really, really useful tool um, so that you can make absolutely sure that you're not missing out on, on any potential funding um, uh, when you before you come to Imperial. Okay, so moving on to the the sort of first uh, chunk of our of our webinar, first bit of our presentation, we're going to have a quick look at loans. Now, a loan, very simply, it's money that is given to you, um, and you then pay that money back at interest. So the cost of that is whatever the loan was plus the interest that that's on that. So very, very simply, it is money that you that you will pay back. Now there are government loan schemes. Um, I've picked out a few a few different ones that we'll just have a sort of very, very quick look at. Um, if you are from the UK, there's a government loan scheme available to you. If you're from the EU, there's a government loan scheme scheme available to you as well. Uh, if you're from Canada, from the US, there's there's federal loans um, also available that you can apply for. So if we take very quick look first of all at the loans that are available for uh, for UK residents and for EU residents and we do a very quick comparison of, of, of those two so if you're from the UK you apply online for your loan via student finance now each of the devolved nations has its own student finance um, sort of administration so if you're from Scotland Northern Ireland Wales you need to have a look at which one of your you need to make sure you're logged on to the one from your particular area of the UK what that gives you if you're coming to study in England and Imperial College is in England um, is a tuition fee loan of up to 9250 pounds a year now that's paid directly to the university. You don't have to worry about that money. 
in any way you just apply for it and if you have an offer from Imperial College um, you can go on and apply for that money and that will be the cost of your degree and each year student finance will pay that directly to Imperial College you don't have to worry about it until you've graduated um, so that's something that you can sort of uh, should put your mind at rest you can also if you're from the UK ap apply for a maintenance loan so this is a separate loan it works a little bit differently the maximum maintenance loan that you can get um, is £11,354. Now that's means tested and it's also based on where you're going to be studying, whether or not you're going to be living in university accommodation, whether you're going to be living um, at home with your parents or guardians. But that is the maximum amount, £11,354. That's paid out to you. It will come into your bank account um, three times a year. Uh, and that will be your responsibility and that's money that you can then use to pay for for rent um, for food for your sort of everyday everyday living costs for EU residents very very similar um, you are eligible for funding from the UK government as an EU resident um, you apply for that by post and what that pays for is a tuition fee loan of up to £9,250 per year. So it works in exactly the same way as, as for UK residents. Um, it comes from the, from the same pot of money. Um, it's a tuition fee loan of up to £9,250 a year uh, for EU residents. You're not eligible, unfortunately, um, for a maintenance loan. So your sort of everyday costs um, beyond your tuition, your cost of living, um, you will need to meet in a different way. Now, there's some terms of that loan. I've tried to make it as, as simple as possible. Um, you only start repaying that loan once you are earning over £21,000 per year or the equivalent, um, whatever, whatever that is. So uh, once you're earning over £21,000 a year, 9% of what you earn above £21,000 um, goes on to, your, to, to pay for your student loan. So... I'm hoping I can make this as uh, simple as possible. If you're earning exactly £21,000 a year, you don't pay anything back. Uh, as long as you're earning £21,000 a year or, or less, you won't make any repayments. Now, if you start earning £22,000 a year, um, then you would pay about £90 a year in repayments. So you're earning £1,000 over £21,000, 9% of that. Um, you would then be paying £90 a year in repayments. If you were earning £50,000 a year or the equivalent, then you would repay about £2,610 per year. So it's progressive in that, uh, in that respect. Um, if you dropped below £21,000, um, if you went over it and then dropped below £21,000, you stop making repayments. So it's only when you're earning over £21,000 that you make repayments. Uh, and in the UK, that comes automatically out of your pay slip um, before you're paid. So you don't actually have to have to do anything uh, to repay that money. Now, if we just have a quick look um, at what that would mean for the, the average Imperial graduate, um, our average starting salary, um, number one in the UK, um, one of the highest average starting salaries in the UK at £33,951 per year. What that means is your average repayment as uh, an Imperial graduate um, would be just over £1,000 per year um, when you graduate, but you don't start paying it back until the April after you've graduated. So you do get some time there to wait before you start um, paying, back, paying back your loan. Um, but given that our average starting salary is so high, um, the two things sort of uh, balance out, I would say. Now, in terms of the US and Canada, I won't spend very long, um, very long on this, but if you are a Canadian student, you can have a look at campusaccess.com. Um, it's got a very good, simple explanation of uh, the Canadian student loan system, um, and that's in the form of a loan and also um, a tax allowance um, as well, if you're the parent or guardian of a student, a Canadian student who's studying abroad, that you can get um, a tax rebate based on based on that amount of money. Um, for US students, two different types of, of loans that you can get, but essentially there's government loans available um, that you can apply for. 
there's some that are low interest loans um, and there's others that are unsubsidized loans where there is interest on those um, so do have a look at those and they are an opportunity for you um, to help fund your undergraduate study um, but do do some more research on those um, you can speak to us and we can give you some more information on those as well um, at the end of the at the end of the webinar if you've got a specific question about those and we'll, we'll try and be um, as helpful as possible now We've got people listening to this webinar from all over the world. We're very, very, very international. So do make sure that you check what your particular country um, offers in terms of in terms of support for undergraduate students, be that in the form of loans um, or be that in the form of scholarships um, and bursaries. Which does bring us quite nicely on to scholarships and bursaries. So um, basically scholarships uh, and bursaries Unlike a loan, generally what happens with those is you don't have to pay them back. This is money that has been invested in you uh, as an individual with lots and lots of potential, lots of prospects um, to try and help you make the absolute best of the educational opportunities um, that you can. They generally come under two categories. So uh, I say internal scholarships and bursaries. So these are ones that are provided by uh, or are unique to Imperial College and external scholarships and bursaries. So they're provided by, um, by people outside of Imperial College. So whether that's a government um, or a charity, quite often those will have some specific aims in terms of the type of students that they, that they, want, to, that they want to support. So if we have a look at um, the first internal Imperial um, bursary that we have. So this is something called the Imperial College Bursary. Now, it's uh, the most generous of its kind um, of all UK universities. What this is, is if you are a student with home fee status, so you're normally resident in the, in the United Kingdom, uh, you can get up to £5,000 worth of support each year. So this is means tested. So it's based on your, on your household income. Uh, and you're, you're automatically... Um, assess for that based on your on what you filled in with student finance so if you're not applying for the loan via student finance then if you do want to be considered for the imperial college bursary then you may well need to fill in some details with student finance in order to be assessed for the imperial college bursary um, so that bursary um, it, it doesn't have a formal application system uh, separate application form via imperial you apply via uh, by the details that you put in with, with student finance. Um, so that could be up to £5,000 worth of extra support per year. That could uh, cover a, a large portion of the difference that you might pay in coming to London, which is one of the more expensive cities um, in the United Kingdom, one of the more expensive cities in the world. We, we recognise that, and that's why this bursary exists, to support students um, so that they can come and study with us here in London. Now that's only for home students. If we're looking at students who are who don't count as home students for their fee status, uh, there's something else called the Imperial President's Undergraduate Scholarships. There's 112 of these um, available for this coming September 2018, 20, uh, leading on into 2019. Uh, and what that gives is a thousand pounds per year of undergraduate study. You're automatically uh, entered into these so if you've applied to us as long as you've applied before the October the 15th um, initial UCAS deadline October the 15th you will have been assessed for one of these or you are currently being assessed for one of these scholarships uh, they're merit-based they're based on um, academic potential and academic history so essentially our personal tutors have combed through your personal statements, they've combed through your, your UCAS application, uh, and then they put forward a short list of people who they want to put forward for a president's undergraduate scholarship. Yeah. It's not a huge financial award, um, but it is an award that really recognises you as an individual and your potential um, as an individual, and a thousand pounds a year is uh, a decent sum of money uh, to help you out. We have sports scholarships as well um, that range between a thousand pounds to three thousand pounds worth of uh, worth of funding for you, and um, plus a whole load of uh, valuable benefits added to those sports scholarships um, as well. So our sports scholarships 
Um, they're about as generous as any sports scholarships that you'll find that you'll find in the UK. Uh, even other universities who have a, a you know a, a reputation specifically for sport, generally their sports scholarships won't be very much more than uh, this one thousand to three thousand um, pounds. Sometimes they're less than that. Um, so those those benefits that I talk about there are you get one to one strength and conditioning coaching, uh, unlimited physiotherapy sessions, mentoring, uh, nutritional advice, sports psychology, um, access to a sports psychologist. Um, so those benefits obviously uh, have a, have a monetary value, but also there's this one thousand to three thousand pounds that's paid to you to support you uh, whilst you are competing as a potential elite sports person for Imperial College. Online, um, you can use something called our scholarship search tool. Now you can use this, you can put in your information. So in terms of whether you're an undergraduate student, postgraduate student, um, you can search for your fee status, are you international, are you home? Uh, hit search uh, and it will come up with a whole series of scholarships that are available kind of internally that are unique to Imperial College. Now, they might be specific only to uh, engineers or specific only to people who are doing physics. So do have a look through all of those scholarships. You are listening to this webinar at the right time in terms of scholarships because a lot of them have opened just after Christmas. Many of them will close again. Uh, some will close in mid-February, some will close in mid-March, some close at the end of April. But basically over the next two, three, four months, this is when you need to finish your application for though for a lot of those scholarships so do jump on there at the end of this webinar or tomorrow next weekend whenever it is but in the next few weeks and have a look at all of those scholarships that are there um so we've got things like the uh, series 500 scholarship uh, which is for our materials engineers it's five thousand pounds per year um, specifically for engineers um, in the materials engineering department um, and really trying to look at people who are going to solve energy problems and do energy modules in the future in their in their third and fourth year of their degree but that's quite a valuable scholarship so do make sure that you look at those do make sure that you that you apply for anything that you're eligible for um, and try and uh, and secure funding through that now this scholarships tool is by no means exhaustive so don't rely on this completely. Uh, I'll tell you some other places where you can look for scholarships as well. But this should be, as a prospective Imperial student, um, this should be your first port of call. There are also, uh, as I mentioned, ex some external scholarship opportunities. So these are just the ones that you can find on our website. And they've got various different um, people uh, that they're looking for. They're various different things, uh, ideals and principles that they want to support. So there's a study abroad scholarship from Wonderpig there, which gives you some money to, to go and experience university um, abroad. There's the push doctor medical grants that's specifically for, for people working in, in the medical field. Um, Institution of Engineering and Technology, which is one of the accrediting bodies for our engineering degrees, uh, they also have a scholarship award as well. So these are the ones again that are just on our website that we link through to. But there are others out there um, based on your citizenship, based on your nationality, um, based on your residency, based on the type of course that you're doing, that you may well be, be eligible for. So don't, again, use this in a, as an exhaustive list. I do do some extra research um, into other ones. So those types of external scholarships that we that we might sort of look at would be things like um, whether or not there's specific government scholarships, whether there's non-governmental organisations like charities, um, quite often have scholarships as well in the sort of development field. Um, industry sometimes have scholarships, various foundations um, have scholarships, and they are looking for students to fund. They want the best students, they want the best applications to come in, um, and they can be very, very generous those scholarships as well. So as I said, do check your potential eligibility both by your residency, so where it is that you're living, and also your citizenship um, as well. So if you are a citizen of one country but living in another, check both of those countries and see what scholarships there are because you may well be eligible for both of them. The other place to go um, after the Imperial website, your first, first place to go, first port of call, would be the British Council website. Now, if you have a look at the British Council website, it has an area for each country in the world. So I've just brought up Egypt's 
uh, British Council uh, website page here. Um, have a look at the one again by citizenship and residency that is that is your for your particular country. In there, they will usually have, if they're available, any of the scholarships that are available based on that particular country. So you can see here for, for Egypt that they link through to a few scholarships on this side, including the uh, the Citadel Capital Scholarship Foundation. So do use the British Council website, have a look at that, see what scholarships are in there. But there's also lots and lots and lots of other sort of third party websites who will have links through to scholarships. Um, if you are really um, really dedicated to find, finding a scholarship, you should expect to sit down for a good few hours at the computer, um, going on Google and looking at all of the different scholarship pages that are available because there are there is lots out there, but you do need to make sure you're looking at the right time and now is really the right time to be looking. Okay, so that brings us to the end of, uh, of our scholarships and, and bursaries section. So we'll have a quick look at, at some part-time work and some of the restrictions around part-time work and some of the opportunities that there are for part-time work um, here whilst you're at Imperial College. Now, if you are an international student and you're here in the UK on what's called a tier four visa, which is a study visa, there are some restrictions on, on the amount of part-time work that you're able to do, but they are fairly generous. So you're permitted to work for up to 20 hours per week during term time, and you're permitted to work full-time during your vacation, during your holidays. Um, so what that means is that 20 hours per week, um, I would say that that is that is quite a generous amount of time to 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 spend per week on part time work, given the fact that your imperial degree is going to be very very intensive. You're going to have a lot of contact hours, and you need to make sure that you have enough time uh, to complete all of your contact hours, complete any of the work you're expected to do outside of the lecture theatre, outside of the seminar room, and still hold down a part time a part time job. But in terms of restrictions. If you're an international student, so you're not from the UK or EU, then uh, the maximum you can work is 20 hours per week during term time. And if you're working in the UK, you'll also need something called a national insurance number. But this isn't something you need to, to get before you come. So you might hear this thrown around. Don't worry about it until you actually arrive uh, and you've secured a job. So you only need a national insurance number um, once you have a job offer uh, and you have proof that you have a job offer, um, you can start work without one and then get it um, afterwards once you've started work. So it shouldn't be a barrier. Um, so don't worry about it if you if you do sort of hear it. In terms of part time work, this sort of divides quite nicely into two into two things: uh, jobs on campus and jobs off campus. So on campus is various various different job job opportunities. Um, we have around 160 paid uh, what are called presidents ambassadors. Individual departments, individual faculties um, quite often have their own ambassadors as well. Now an ambassador is a current imperial student who works to represent the university at events. Um, so you may well, if you come to one of our open days, you will see President's ambassadors in blue hoodies. They're the current students who are leading you on a campus tour, giving you directions, telling you about their, their thoughts and feelings about Imperial College. Um, they're also used, um, we ask them to return back to their old school, whether or not that's um, in the UK or internationally um, as well. They have this opportunity to return to their old school to go and speak to people in the years below about their experience. Now, these are all paid opportunities. They're not volunteers. So there is a selection process for those. Um, you do an interview. You have to do an, a, a little application. Um, but that is an opportunity in terms of part time work that you can take on and you can fit that around your studies as well. So you don't have a set set hours each week. You don't have set shifts. What we do is we'll send out what opportunities there are available for the ambassadors at the beginning of the month um, and you can sign up for whichever work it is that you want to want to sign up for. So it's flexible around your around your degree. The Students Union here at Imperial also um, it, it's run by and for students and it employs a lot of students as well. So whether or not they're they're working in the bar, they're working in the Students Union shop, et cetera, et cetera. Those are part time work opportunities here on the campus that you can that you can look at. The catering outlets and the shops on campus as well. 
they also um, employ students again on a flexible basis very very used to employing employing people around their degree course so those opportunities are, are very very useful to have a look at um, question we quite often get asked um, by prospective undergraduate students um, is is there any opportunity to sort of help out with teaching and, and things like that um, in terms of paid teaching uh, this is, is not something that is available to undergraduate students in terms of being being a te paid teaching assistant you would have to wait um, until you were a master's student or a PhD student to, to take on that opportunity. So don't rely on the fact that you're gonna, potentially going to be able to, to do some teaching um, and to do that. In terms of opportunities off campus, we have something called Jobs Live, which is our careers department's sort of central area where external employers can put up jobs that they have, where specifically they would like imperial students to, to do those jobs. Now, they might be uh, jobs that are flexible work that has nothing to do with your degree. And um, so it might be working in, in museums or working in shops in the local area and things like that. There might be things separately, specifically for Imperial students, where a business wants its uh, website redesigned, but it doesn't want to pay a company thousands and thousands of pounds for a professional redesign of its of its website. So they might ask for a, a current student who's sort of suitably qualified um, and give them some, some money for doing that. So there's a couple of different types of, of jobs there. Um, but basically, there's plenty in the local area. We are in a sort of university uh, university hub so the, the employees in the local area are very very used to employing uh, students and offering them uh, shift patterns that that sort of fit around fit around their course so that is something using jobs live that you can you can have a have a look at um, in terms of your internships in terms of work experience and things like that um, sometimes that work experience um, your internship might be paid but again that's sort of down to the down to the employer um, as well and whether or not that's paid in in terms of paying you a salary or whether or not it's paid with a uh, sort of honorarium at the at the end of the the internship or the work experience um, but do have a look because most of our courses will have the opportunity to get some work experience or get an internship built into them uh, do check whether or not those are paid opportunities um, or unpaid opportunities very very quickly i'm going to talk br briefly about budgeting um and the, the main piece of advice that i have in terms of budgeting um if you are in receipt of a maintenance loan this is paid in three portions across the year uh, and you're in charge of that spending nobody is going to be saying to you are you sure that you want to spend your entire student loan uh, on one particular uh, one particular thing right at the beginning of term if you run out of money in terms of your maintenance loan, there are hardship funds as well at the university that you that you can come and speak to. But really, you're an adult; you're in charge of your spending, so you need to just be aware that your uh, that your maintenance loan is going to be paid three times a year, and there's no more money coming out of that maintenance loan um, before the next the next due date for it, which could be in three or four months' time. Uh, so don't do what uh, one person at university who I knew did, which was to buy some very, very expensive DJ decks at the beginning of his university career with his maintenance loan, and then he spent an entire term just living on one large bag of rice. Uh, so do just bear in mind that you are going to have to budget, you're going to have to think about how many weeks you're going to have to pay, uh, buy food for, how much rent you're going to be paying, and all of this sort of stuff. Um, in terms of uh, getting a mobile phone deal as well, there's plenty of monthly deals you can do in the UK. So that's one thing I would say, don't necessarily sign up to a very, very expensive mobile phone contract if you're uh, an international student um, and you want to use your phone in the UK um, because you're gonna return home for three or four months of the year, uh, more than likely, and you're gonna be paying an expensive mobile phone contract. So you can get those monthly. Make lots of use of uh, student travel discounts. So if you're using the, the underground, if you're using the buses, um, you will get a pretty substantial student discount on all of those things. So do make sure of, that you use those. But really the, the main tip is to get 
get plenty of advice in your first few weeks and before you come um, there's a whole variety of sources available where you can get advice from so we have a bank on campus who will help you if you're an international student they will help you set up an international uh, help you set up a UK bank account um, but they'll also give you advice about budgeting they'll also give you advice about building up a, a credit score and things like that and we also have our student hub which is basically it's a one-stop shop for advice and help and they can signpost you in the right direction um, they've got lots and lots of practical advice about um, making the most of your money in London the other thing that you I would recommend that you have a read of uh, we've got lots of student blogs there's a specific student blog um, from from one of our student bloggers uh, called Paula who has talked about London and how best to afford living in London so do have a quick read of that and have a have a look at what her thoughts were about that um, and see what see how she managed to afford living in London um, but do as I say use the student hub use the bank on campus and get there get their advice so in terms of doing any further research that you that you want to do there is something called the alternative guide to uh, to funding it's called the alternative guide to postgraduate funding but it does have quite a lot of information about undergraduate funding in there as well it's got some real good practical steps um, so do do have a look at that alter alternative guide if you google the alternative guide to postgraduate funding download it have a look at it and it's got got lots and lots of practical advice in there um, not always from the most usual uh, usual sources it has some unusual scholarships in there as well um, so do have a look at those um, if you um, are a student who's who considers yourself to be disabled there is also the uh, the option of something called in the UK called the disabled students allowance if that is something that you think you might be eligible for um, then you can google the disabled disabled students allowance or you can get in touch with our with our support team here at Imperial and they can talk to you about about how that works now that disabled students allowance isn't necessarily just in the form of money um, it's also in the form of, of support and practical support whether or not that's um, IT whether or not that's um, printing credits um, th there's a whole whole raft of, of, of support for disabled students but the disabled students allowance is specifically um, specifically ex extra money um, to to support you as a disabled student whilst you're at university so that you're that you're not uh, at a disadvantage the other ways um, obviously to find out more follow us on all of the different uh, different types of social media we are on all of them it's a very very good Facebook group for Imperial uh, prospective Imperial students you can ask questions on there um, and you can see any practical advice that's been uploaded in there as well and then obviously you can come along to our open days you can come any time of the year for a student-led campus tour you just have to sign up for those we'll show you around the campus and you'll get an opportunity to speak to a current student ask them about their thoughts you get to see your department um, see all the different areas where you'll be sort of living studying um, and seeing what the sort of atmosphere is at Imperial College London Individual departments have their own open days as well. So if you keep an eye on the on the web pages for the particular department that you're interested in applying to, very very often um, the international officers such as myself um, will make visits out uh, all over the world. So um, I'm in India next week. So if you're listening in from India, although it's probably pretty late in India at the moment, um, I'm going to be in several countries in India. So do have a look at the um, at the pages. Uh, for prospective international students and see where international student recruitment officers are visiting so you can meet us face to face obviously our email addresses are on there as well so you can ask us uh, ask us questions there as well uh, and our global summer school various other types of summer schools that, that we have um, are now available to be signed up to but very specifically the global summer school um, it takes place obviously during the summer uh, and it's a couple of weeks of, of very very practical uh, interdisciplinary work where you will come and you'll do a project with imperial lecturers imperial professors in a team uh, and then you'll present that uh, to real to real imperial staff at the at the end of that project it's a really really good way to find out if imperials for you if you enjoy the teaching style if you if you enjoy that sort of interdisciplinary working with people from from other faculties um, if you enjoy that sort of style of learning uh, do have a look at the global summer school 
on our website. Okay, so that brings us to the end of today's webinar. So as I, as I said, there is that questions tab in the, in the corner. So do ask us questions and we'll try and um, get, get back to you and, uh, and answer, those answer those questions. Now, what we said was we would try and answer some of your questions live whilst we're here so if there are if there are sort of general more kind of generic question um then we will try and answer that live um but if it's a more sort of specific question then we uh, we would answer that a little bit later later on okay so the first question that we have is it's about tuition fees so are tuition fees fixed at a definite value at the point of entry and hold true for the entire four years or are they subject to inflation each year um so those those tuition fees are subject to are subject to um inflation but the they are only subject to, in, to inflation. There's not going to be an increase to the principal amount of the fee um, itself. So if you're being charged a certain amount of money, you're not suddenly going to our fees for you personally. If you start at Imperial on, on, on one amount of, uh, of fee, they're not going to go up by any more than than the inflation each year. Um, if you're an international student, the, the other thing obviously to, to bear in mind as well is if you're paying your fees in a currency other than pounds, the fee is subject to normal fluctuations in the value of the pound and the value of whichever currency it is that you're that you're planning on paying your fees in. So, what that means, uh, given that the pound's value has fallen um, quite a lot over the over the past sort of 12, 18 months, for various reasons, that our degrees compared to how they were um, before. Are cheaper in terms of the in terms of the value of your of your currency because the pound has become less valuable. But the answer to that question is, they hold for point of entry for the full four years. They're only subject to inflation. Um, they're not subject to um, to kind of just just us raising our fee in the middle of your in the middle of your degree. Okay, so just having a look for um, other questions that we. Uh, that we can answer whilst we're here. So there's one which is: um, Does it become difficult to manage your studies uh, on top of a on top of a part-time job? Now, in terms of managing your your studies and managing a part-time job, uh, this is going to be down to the to the individual student and the individual course that, that you're doing. Now, you're going to have to be realistic in that Imperial College, like I said before. Uh, ha has quite an intense workload in terms of the number of contact hours that you have and the amount of time outside of the classroom that you're expected to be to be working so if you have 20 to 25 hours of contact time Monday to Friday each week then outside of that you might have another 10 to 15 hours of extra work that you're doing group work and things like that now that that workload is significantly higher than most other universities in the UK um, and and for, for for good reason now you have to just balance those two things two things together and it's going to come down to the student it's going to come down to how organized you are personally it's going to come down to how understanding your um, your employer is in terms of that in terms of that part-time work so it's it's only as difficult I would say it's only as difficult as you as you make it if you find that you've bitten off more than you can more than you can chew in terms of your part-time job then you can speak to the student hub about getting some uh, some practical advice about going to your employer and saying to them that actually that this this is there's too much I've got too many hours the main thing that you need to do is make sure that your job knows that you're a full-time student and is flexible. So whether or not that's working in a in a shop or working in a in a bar, whatever that is, those shifts tend to be relatively flexible. Um, and as long as you've got an under understanding employer, it, you should be able to balance those those two things. Now, um, 
what we're going to do now is we're going to answer um, any specific questions that you that you have. We'll answer those within the questions tab, one to one. So we are going to work our way through all of those questions. We are coming to you, um, but there are uh, there are quite a few of them. So we'll we will work our way to you. If you do log out, your question disappears, and we won't be able to answer it. Um, so do just leave yourself signed in. We will get round. To, we will get round to answering your question um, very very soon. Um, and if you've got any more questions, do uh, you can email us separately if you want to. If we don't get round to answering your question, so the email address is is just at the bottom there. So it's international recruitment at imperial.ac.uk, uh, and one of the international team will get back to you if you can't hang around and wait um, because you need to go to bed, or if you're on the other side of the world, uh, if you need to to get up and go to work. Um, so. Thank you very, very much for listening. Do ask us uh, questions either by email or via the questions tab. I hope you found it useful. Uh, and do look out for our other webinars that uh, will be upcoming. Uh, we have another webinar in March um, for if you have an offer to talk to you a little bit more about Imperial and about, about that offer. We have some recordings of webinars as well that we've done earlier on in the year, which is just about um, undergraduate study, and what life is like um, at Imperial. Uh, and that has one of our current president's ambassadors called Nim, who you can, you can listen to what his experience was like um, there as well. So thank you very, very much for listening. Um, I hope you found it. I hope you found it useful. And we'll get around to answering your questions now. Thank you.